Hi. In this video, the final video in which we finally introduce the principal curvature, I'll do a lot of talking and almost no writing. So that's why I zoomed in on the board a little bit so you can see the details of what I've drawn. And we'll just talk about the concepts of principal curvature. And I will just state what they are. So this is a very visual, there are a lot of linear algebra and just a lot of talking, no writing. But here is what I did. I took the relationship that we derived in the next, in the last video. Beautiful relationship that relates, for lack of a better term, mean curvatures. And I looked at the component of this equation that's normal to the surface. And that's very easily accomplished. You just dot both sides with the normal. In other words, multiplied by n sub i. So of course, we get a 1 here, a 1 here. And because this normal is tangential to the surface, and capital Ni is normal to the surface, this term goes away. So that's how you extract the normal component from a relationship like this. And of course, I arrived right here, which is really <laughs> a very nice relationship uh, that relates the mean curvature of the surface as embedded in the overall space. Of course, not just the mean curvature, but the curvature tensors. And this is how the curve shows up on the right-hand side through these normals. I'll tell you about what I drew in a second. So that's what we have on the left-hand side. Very nice expression. And on the right-hand side, we have this object whose, that characterizes the way the curve is embedded on the overall space without any regard to the surface that it's on. Right? There's no surface without this here that it's embedded on, that it's embedded into, embedded in. Right? So this has to do with how the curve, this object, is embedded in the overall space. So it's a very nice relationship. And now let me explain to you what I drew on the picture. So here we have the surface. It's like a semi-sphere. And I drew two curves. And I drew two curves within it. Here is one, and here is another. And they're not just any curves. This is how the geometric thinking went. So this is very geometric, so prepare to visualize. So what these curves are, are cross sections between the curve and the planes. And not just any planes, planes that are at a point of interest, let's call this the point of interest through which these two curves pass. Here is one, it kind of follows this outline, and here is another, it's kind of orthogonal to it, where they meet. So we're really interested in what's going on at this point. We're going to define principal curvatures at this point, and then at all the other points you would have to do similar constructions. So here's what we do. We slice the surface with a plane that passes through this point, and not just any plane, but planes such that it contains the normal, the normal to the surface. So that leaves just one family of planes, the planes that contain the normal. You can call it, can you call them normal planes in a way you can at this point? Yeah, I guess you can, right? But all of these planes that you can slice through the surface, they all contain this normal. So you can imagine the drawing of this normal and this family of planes, they sort of pivot on this normal as an axis and they rotate, right? And for all these different orientation, you see different slices. So that's the construction that we're talking about. Not just any curves, but only curves that are obtained by sections with planes. So in this discussion, there is something very Euclidean uh, going on. Okay, so... Now, let's consider this plane that produced this very nice curve. I was kind of pleased with the way it came out. All right, and here's the plane. So, within that plane, this curve is a hypersurface. So, you can very much talk about its mean curvature or its curvature. We haven't talked about the curvature of the plane as, as a one-dimensional object. That's really not that important here. It's this other perspective that's primary here, right? But you can talk about the mean curvature of this curve. Okay. Uh, I'm thinking as I'm talking because I'm, is it about mean curvature or is it about uh, the principal normal and the standard curvature? Uh, I'll have to give it a few more moments of, of thought. 
But let's for now talk about mean curvature, I guess. Yeah, that's fine, I believe. OK. And we can ask the following question. Here is a very interesting question that we can ask. So, ah, well, first, what is the mean curvature of this curve as embedded in this plane? And of course, it's right here. Because its normal in this plane is, of course, the same normal. This is the same normal, and I'll write it with an index, ni. It's the same normal. So this normal is the normal to the overall surface. But within the slicing plane, it's also the normal to this curve. And because it's this object, this is, we discussed this throughout these videos, is dotted with this normal. It's simply the mean curvature of this curve as embedded in the plane. And now we're prepared to ask the following question. What is the largest value that can be obtained and what is the smallest value? In other words, which uh, plane, right? We have a family of planes that all rotate around this normal as an axis. Which plane would give you the, lar the largest curvature and which plane would give you the smallest curvature? And it's not an absolute value, it's with a sign. Negative curvatures, uh, yeah, so just as I said that, I realized that we're not talking about mean curvatures, which are subject to the sign, right? We're really talking about uh, curvature in the sense that will come a little bit later. For now, what we can do is just remove the arbitrariness of the choice of normal. Pick one of the normals, and with respect to that normal, talk about the curvatures. And once this normal is chosen, now you can talk about the largest curvature, regardless of sign, and the smallest curvature. So the smallest curvature might be minus 2, and the largest curvature might be 5. Something like that. So no longer arbitrariness in sign because this normal is chosen uh, in the beginning of the entire discussion. And then everything works. So because that determines the sign of this, the sign of this, uh, and of course the sign of this because this, this normal is chosen. All right, so now it's all clear, <laughs> at least to me. Okay, and that's the question. Right? What direction gives you the largest curvature? and what direction gives you the smallest curvature. And those two curvatures are called the principal normals. So that's the definition. Among all possible slicing planes that contain the normal to the, to the surface, choose the one that delivers the largest curvature and the one that delivers the smallest curvature. There's, there's a lot of beautiful geometry going on here. And if this was a course in differential geometry, we would very much dwell on the results and the discussions of special cases and draw toruses and cylinders and all of those things which would be very important to do. You should absolutely do it. It's just that this course is more about the technique than and getting the results rather than the interpretation of the results. Both are equally important, but the derivation of the results needs to come first. So that's our focus. I envision a separate series on differential geometry where we'll talk all about special examples and what it means and so forth. Okay. So how do you find what those planes are, what those directions are? Of course, the answer is contained on the right-hand side. All we really get to choose, all that the curve really gives to the right-hand side is these two normals, basically just that direction, right? Because the normal just depends on the orientation of, the, of the, that cutting, slicing straight uh, plane. Okay, so the question now becomes here. What is the largest possible value that's attainable here? And what's the smallest possible value of attain here? And you're beginning to see eigenvalues coming in because we're talking about quadratic form minimization subject to the constraint that these two, uh, well, it's really just one, that this object is unit length in its own sense. Okay, so really the uh, eigenvalues of B alpha beta are about to show up. Okay, and to make it just a very straightforward quadratic form optimization problem, we're really shifting into linear algebra. That's why it's a lot of talking and not a lot of writing. Let's introduce letters for those eigenvalues. Considering it's a two-dimensional case, let's call them kappa 1 and kappa 2. That's standard notation. Kappa 1 and kappa 2 mean these are our principal curvatures. This is the largest possible attainable curvature. 
This is the smallest possible, or the other way around, attainable curvature. That's fine, smallest, largest. Okay. And, uh, well, let me actually give them a different definition, and then this will be a consequence. Let's call kappa 1 and kappa 2 the eigenvalues of this matrix. That's what, let's define them. Let's define them this way, and then what I just said will be a consequence. So you'll see that in a moment. So let this be one eigenvalue, this is the other, this is the smaller, this is the larger of this matrix. Symmetric matrix, because, you know, you can switch these indices. Okay, so to make it a straightforward uh, quadratic form optimization problem, let's write it this way. So I prepared it here. So this, of course, can be written this way. And you can easily see that. It's a very nice trick, because... You can really put these little n's here as maybe n beta, n beta, because n beta, lower beta, upper beta. n beta, n beta is 1, so you can stick it in here. And then with the help of the shift tensor, you can really write this 1 here as s alpha beta and alpha n beta. That's a way of sticking in 1. So pretend there's a 1 here, and you can write 1 as s alpha beta n alpha n beta. That's a fancy one. And of course, now these alphas need to be renamed into gammas or else there's a clash. So this can be rewritten this way. Right? Well, then now it's a straightforward uh, I, uh, quadratic form optimization problem, minimization or maximization, where let's just rewrite it in the metric in the matrix form. Well, what is Okay, I realized I made a slight mistake, and I only have 10 minutes to finish recording this. So I don't want to start from the beginning. But what we're going to do is this. I will rewrite this in a slightly different way. I will raise the index alpha, and I will lower the index alpha here. So this will become delta alpha beta, and this will become B alpha beta, the curvature tensor with the index raised, and this will be n alpha. Okay, and kappa 1 and kappa 2 are, of course, defined as the eigenvalues of this matrix with the index raised. And, of course, it's in that context that they are invariants. Okay, so I take back what I said before. In fact, I'll probably erase that. So here is the definition of kappa 1 and kappa 2. Kappa 1 and kappa 2 are the eigenvalues of this matrix. And we will prove in a moment that they correspond to the smallest and largest curvatures uh, in the context that I described here. So, it can be, so everything can be rewritten this way, and now looks like a straightforward quadratic form optimization problem. And... Now let's employ the matrix uh, notation, where this contraction can be written as, well, what's B gamma gamma? It's the trace of this tensor, or of this matrix. And as the trace of this matrix, it is, of course, the sum of the eigenvalues. So this is just kappa 1 plus kappa 2. So mean curvature is the sum of the eigenvalues of this matrix. So this is kappa 1 plus kappa 2. This, of course, is equivalent to the identity matrix. And here we have the curvature tensor itself. So in the matrix notation, it can be written in, the, in this form. Kappa 1 plus kappa 2, that's being the trace. The chronic delta is represented by the identity matrix I minus the matrix itself. The N transpose on the left, N on the right. And now the question is, what is the largest possible value of this number, given that this is a unit vector? And the answer is, of course, the eigenvalue, the eigenvalues of this matrix. Not the eigenvalues of this matrix, but the eigenvalues of this matrix. And it is, of course, a super simple linear algebra exercise that I will save for you to show that the eigenvalues of this matrix are also kappa 1 and kappa 2, but they're kind of 
you won't understand what I'm saying now until you work through the details, but they're switched around. So if you look at a matrix A, which has eigenvalues 3 and 4, and consider the matrix 7i minus A, it will also have eigenvalues 3 and 4, but the eigenvectors will switch themselves. The eigenvector that used to correspond to 3 will now correspond to 4, and the eigenvector that used to correspond to 4 now corresponds to 3. So, if kappa 1 and kappa 2 are the eigenvalues of this matrix, then they're also the eigenvalues of this matrix, and that means they're the lowest and the largest values of this expression, and that means that they're the lowest and the largest possible curvatures of the picture drawn here with the slicing planes. And they therefore correspond to the principal curvatures, and we can see that mean curvature is the sum of these curvatures because it's the trace, and the trace equals the sum of the eigenvalues. And, sometimes, and now you also understand why it's called mean curvature because sometimes it is defined as this sum plus t divided by 2, but then, of course, the denominator would depend on the dimension of the problem that we're considering, and the sum of the advantages and disadvantages is on the negative, so it's just defined as the sum. So maybe it shouldn't be called mean curvature. That's historical when it was defined this way. Of course, it's still defined like this in probably 30% of the books. Uh, but then the definition, one, like I said, depends on the dimensionality, which I find slightly inconvenient. It's not a big point in any case. So now you understand mean curvature. It's the sum of principal curvatures, completely generalizes to higher dimensions as well. And you also understand Gaussian curvature, which by Gauss's theorem or Gregium for two-dimensional surfaces embedded in three-dimensional spaces is just the determinant of this matrix. And of course, the determinant of the matrix is the product of its eigenvalues. So Gaussian curvature we use the letter capital K, is the product of kappa 1, excuse me, is the product of kappa 1 plus kappa 2. So the sum of principal curvatures is mean curvature, and the product of mean curvatures is Gaussian curvature. So there you go. We have, in one day, marched from considering double embeddings of curves and surfaces in ambient space to the concept of principal curvature, and connected it back to mean curvature and, of course, Gaussian curvature in the Euclidean case. So this was very exciting, and thank you very much. See you next time.